Okay, so hi everybody. I've been uh, asked to do uh, a session for IT architects. Uh, um, and I think uh, we might have some other kind of competences listening in, but I hope Let's say that a minimum requirement would be to uh, actually realize and understand what an API is. And if you have that uh, as a prerequisite, I think you, you will be good to go. Um, uh, so uh, there's a lot of content for these, uh, uh, you know, all, all the different sessions that we have. So uh, I thought that we would do like, um, a uh, technical kind of uh, deep dive into Ugio uh, and what Ugio is and how we see that our technology relates to uh, other, uh, you know, network uh, protocols and uh, applications on top of Ugio and in the long run how we see that Ugio is beneficial for, you know, business development really. Uh, that's what it's all about in the end. Um, but I thought that I would do take uh, sort of a, a different stance on things. Uh, I, I my, myself, uh, my name is Robert. Um, I have been working as an IT architect for plus 20 years in different organizations. Uh, uh, but for the last two years, I've been working all of a sudden as a sales guy here at um, Sensitive. So. Um, what I thought I, I would do is uh, to bring on board our software architect, uh, Ulrich. Um, and, uh, you know, just have a, a conversation with Ulrich on, you know, how we, the, the ideas on how we have built uh, Ugio and where we are today and, and bits and pieces of where we are uh, heading uh, with our development of Ugio. Um, but first off, uh, uh, some basics. Uh, so Ugio is, uh, is an um, integration or data sharing platform for IoT. Uh, we are very good at integrating like downwards in the stack to any kind of technology or, you know, different uh, radio protocols um, or, or different kind of devices may it be more of traditional kind of devices using Modbus or Bucknet and, and these kind of things. Uh, mo most likely the already existing uh, devices uh, at our customer site. Uh, but then the other part is, is the modern uh, IoT devices and IoT uh, protocols such as LoRaWAN or uh, narrowband IoT and, and stuff like that, um, which is our dojo where we are, you know, very good at. Um, so what we do with Ugio is we bring all these different devices over different protocols into one and same platform. Um, we always think about IoT from a bi-directional perspective. Uh, so if you know the technology and the devices let us control them, then you know we can do that. So if we catch a value saying that there is a water leak, then, you know, turn off the, 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 the water. It just makes sense. And I think we have a special session just for water later on. Um, then what we do is we bring in all the data in, in the same platform. Uh, and we try to normalize the data so as to make it very easy for the, the, the application developers or, or the, the data guys and they usually love to work with Ugio because, you know, it makes their life just so much easier. Um, if if uh, a value is formatted in one way using one technology, we will transform it into a, a standard kind of way uh, and if, then bring it in from another kind of device and, and we will format the, 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 the payload the same way for, uh, for each and every, you know, of the data uh, points that we are collecting. Um, and then we have uh, an automation engine in Ugio uh, where we can make things happen. Uh, it's uh, of the type if this, then that. So if something happens under certain con uh, conditions, then uh, we take action. And the action can be easy things like send a text or, or, or uh, an email. 
but it can also be to uh, turn off, uh, like I said, like the, the, the water valve, or it might be to uh, send a push notification to uh, another business system that you're using, um, or whatever it might be. It's very, very powerful, yet simple to understand and, and work with. Um, uh, yeah, I forgot to say that, you know, all the data we, of course, um, save in a time series database. So you can, uh, through our API, look at the historic uh, data uh, for, for all the data that you're collecting and make sense of it. Um, and yeah, I mean, the whole idea with Digio is to deliver to our partners and to our customer a horizontal uh, kind of architectural way, uh, an integration platform that connects all your devices, the tens of thousands or millions of devices into the same platform and create the business value on top of our platform. Uh, the other way of doing things would be to do like a vertical solution that, you know, uh, which there are plenty of out there doing excellent uh, applications and, and, and uh, you know, with great value for their customers, but they are doing one thing and one thing only. And we think that when the organizations have, you know, tens of thousands of devices, uh, and you know they, they are in different verticals. It's gonna be like the classic spaghetti soup, and it's gonna be impossible to bring uh, value out of that in 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 the end. So that is what we do with Ugio. Um, yeah, we are basing our platform on a lot of open source components. Um, you know, ready to go, uh, heavily used open source components. And then we add our own uh, IPR on it, our own code uh, to uh, put all these things together. Uh, and of course, we uh, are basing our platform a, a lot on uh, Fireware. Uh, Fireware is a European initiative uh, uh, for, for more or less a global standard on how to uh, express data. Uh, there's a lot of data objects and, and a data format, but also there's a lot of uh, a number of open source components that you can uh, readily use uh, and, and create your own platform if you wish to do so. Uh, but uh, uh, then we have combined this, uh, these uh, firewall components with a lot of other components, thus, uh, you know, and, and with our own uh, code, thus uh, uh, bringing it all together uh, under the name Ugio. Um, yeah. Ugyo is uh, um, the name comes from the Nor Norse uh, mythology. Uh, it's the tree tree of um, tree of life uh, with the roots down into the the, the soil and uh, the people uh, with the branches going up to the gods. Then uh, in, uh, equates to uh, uh, I don't know uh, the plumbing, the hardcore integration to the devices, and then making uh, music happen on top of that uh, using. I don't know, the, the, the BI solutions and the AI solutions and the business applications and, and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Okay, so what I will do now is I will uh, go out uh, in the landscape and see if I find Ulrich and um, just have a chat with him and uh, talk about you know, his ideas and thoughts uh, on our architecture. Uh, Are you okay with the okay, with the core? Uh, well, okay, and pl uh, well, please note that if you put the camera towards that camera, uh, so yeah, well, uh, here we're working with a partner called Precise Biometrics. So I actually just need to point my face toward that one, and it locks uh, up. The lock goes. Okay. So yeah, it's Corona time, so not so, not a lot of people in in the office. So Ulrich, yeah. my friend, are you ready to do a session? We're actually we started to record right away. <laughs> so let's go, Ulrich. <laughs> if you look at Igeo, what it is is that. Um, from a top-level perspective, it looks really simple, 
you know, you bring in some users, you bring in some devices, and you bring in some applications and services, and, um, you know, uh, that's it. The IGEO's role is to make sure that the proper data is sent to the proper service at the proper time with the proper access rights so that you can turn it on and off a, a lighting in your house, but nobody else should be able to, uh, you know. It, kind of is that the, the devil is in the details because you, you want it to always work. So even if many people are turning on and off their lighting in their homes, yours should still work, right? Yeah. You want that. Uh, you want the security. Uh, you want the scalability. You, you want the, 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 the nice cozy feeling that things are we got your back yeah so, so on the on the surface of things uh, you know it's quite simple and we want it to be simple we, we, we want to propagate um, that feeling that this is simple there is a nice API an open source uh, you know a specification that is open sourced yeah. um, and it's a standard go ahead use it and what we want <clears throat> to and we let us take care of the the nasty stuff because there is a lot of devil in the details of getting this stuff right. Yeah. Um, so uh, you are right. We are based on a lot of open source components. We we uh, we don't want to write code that's already been written by someone else if it's open sourced in a in a permissive license. We we think that then we can go ahead and use it. Yeah, so, I, know, I know the license. Uh, we have been talking a lot about different licenses. Uh, that, that sometimes uh, makes uh, our life a bit uh, troublesome. It does. Answer. Yeah, it does. So, so how are we working with license? I'm not a part of that on a daily no, no, business, no. but I know that you guys uh, think a lot about it. We do. So uh, when we bring in components, uh, uh, we have a nightly uh, build job on our servers that go through all our source code and checks which components we're using and what license they are licensed under. Okay. And we get a list, and uh, we have already compiled the list of licenses that we want to use, and we've compiled the list of licenses that we really don't want to use. Okay. And uh, if there is an error in that build job, I get that, and we get that in the morning. So as soon as somebody brings in a, a component that doesn't work, we are we're pretty much immediately notified. So um, what what do we, what do we do then? I mean, do we re replace yeah, things? Yeah, we, we we find an alternative. Okay. So typically, if if a developer brings in something new, a new component that, that we don't like the license of, uh, we we switch it up before it gets too late, meaning that we we soldered it in too much in our own source code. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the build that you're talking about, I'm guessing, is in the early stages. Yeah, so. we, it's run nightly, yeah, every yeah. night. Um, yeah. Um, could you say something about the the, the basic like uh, I'm I'm talking about Docker's and Kubernetes and and your microservice kind of architecture, yeah. which is you know I understand the concepts, but you know not to detail that that I'm comfortable talking about it. <laughs> yeah. So the the thing is that a microservice uh, is pretty much the way you build a service. You when you build a platform these days, you it's a modern design. You use that pattern. Yeah. That design pattern is used by many, so it's not no magic there. And we're trying to run with components that everybody else is using. In our in our world, we're using Rabbit. Uh, others are using Kafka, but they're pretty much this, it's a message bus. Yeah, and that allows us to pretty much uh, scale our design as we see fit. So, for yeah. example, if we if we have a REST API that takes care of servicing the applications. And we feel or we see that it's being uh, high traffic. We can spin up another REST API, and that will be automatically load balanced by Rabbit, which is our. So, uh, what, what, would these two different APIs be like perceived as one API yeah. from yeah, a customer yeah. perspective? Yes, that's so that, magic for me. Yeah, it is. It, it actually, especially when you bring in Kubernetes into all this, because then it auto scales, uh -huh. which means that it will. We don't even have to have a. a a DevOps or server person actually doing the job, it will do it for us. So it will monitor the traffic and scale up and down automatically. So this is this is very magical. Yeah. But it it's um, from a technical perspective, it's really cool. It actually works. It's uh, so thank you Google for the Kubernetes. Engine. I actually remember you guys sitting in this room 
like might be a year and a half ago or something like that when you actually shut down one machine and the other one took over automatically yeah, that was, and you still had the light on or something like that yeah yeah that was <laughs> that was that was fantastic yeah, yeah so now we go we are moving that so it's, it's taken a quite a while but we are moving that into production uh, you know as we speak yeah i i, I love it I, I think it's very cool and i Suspect my uh, well, our customers will really appreciate it. I mean, yeah, what they, what I hope is that you know, they, is that they will, they will not see it. They, they, we, what we will deliver as a result of this is that we will deliver a stable Igio. Yeah, I mean, I mean, our, our, you know, the, like this session is for the IT guys. Uh, they will uh, appreciate it at yeah, least yeah, yeah, sure. well, on a business end. They usually complain when things are not working. Yes, uh, they're not necessarily giving you credit when it is working. Uh, that's so. the worker of a plumber, you know. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's <laughs> when the, everything's working, everybody's happy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, in in terms of you know this being a, like a microservice uh, kind of architecture, uh, as I understand it, what you can do then is to actually take one component that you know performs a certain function in, in this uh, system of you know uh, components and replace it with another one that has been perhaps uh, you know has been developed or being better or a completely different one doing the same task. So, but from from my end, uh, I, I, I like I said, I understand the concept of it. But really, is it that simple? No, not really. We we can do that. Uh, so, microservice design lends itself to being redesigned a bit. You can you can do redesign work without actually having to redesign the whole system. So it's not like the olden days when things like were everything was tied into everything else. It was more like spaghetti. Yeah. This, this when you do micro design, microservice design, it's kind of automatically componentized. So you can do one piece at a time change if you like. Yeah. Uh, we've done that over the years, but um, things have stabilized. So we're we're pretty happy with where we are design wise. Yeah. So yeah, I um, I um, I was thinking, and and uh, you know now I'm I'm not on thin ice, and maybe. Our editors will edit this out later on, I'm not sure, but uh, fr from my point of view, when I've been working as an architect, it's been very close to the business side of things. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, modeling like the system landscape. Uh, what does it look like? What, what kind of capabilities do you have inside our organization that supports the business, right? So fr from my end, uh, Ugyo as a whole, uh, is one of these, you know, com containers in a larger system of other, you know, components that you have. You might have identity and access management systems. You might have like a, a data warehouse, uh, perhaps uh, like an open data services for, you know, publicly publicly available. Of course, you have your your web and stuff like that, uh, your ERP and, and so forth. Uh, would you agree on that like view on uh, it's for me it's the same kind of architecture that you you have like modules that performs different functions inside of the the uh, uh, like it's a system landscape yeah absolutely no I agree completely with that so what we're trying to do with Igeo is that we're trying to make sure that we can uh, be interoperable with other systems uh, and if we're not if we can design it at least so that we can be no. So we've had customers being uh, asking us to be uh, to um, send logs to their log server. Uh, um, you know, as a part of interoperability, of course we're doing that. No. Sending data to a data warehouse, well, we do that too. That's not a problem. No. And we also have an example of people, uh, like you mentioned, the access management, the identity management system, uh, being you know customers having some kind of Active Directory where they store their usage. No. We can pick them up from there. No. So I think that that's a really important part of the bigger design is that we, we can make it work in a corporate environment. We are yeah. not an island uh, isolated in any way. No, I mean, uh, I, I did some talk in the introduction here about, you know, verticals uh, versus, you know, being able to integrate to whatever and make it fly. Right? Yeah. Uh, so I, I see it uh, crystal clear that 
but it, it, it's balanced also because uh, there are we have been talking about for instance let's take machine learning yeah right we have been uh, doing project using machine learning to do some uh, really cool projects to uh, forecast you know what will happen uh, and with good success it's Absolutely. been working so next uh, thing that we're talking about then okay should we bring in machine learning as a component inside of uh, Agio and you know have it be part of what we are producing or should we uh, uh, how should I put it? Uh, uh, try to, to make Ugo as slim as possible mm -hmm. uh, in order to not compete with our customers' efforts in terms of machine learning. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you have a stance or ideas and thoughts on that? You know, I mean, well, the thing is that we we want to be able to execute models, but we don't. So the stance is that we don't want to do compute intensive things inside of Igeo because of the fact that we want to be able to provide uh, we want it to be quick and fast and we want to make sure that the customers can count on that we will send the data quickly and fast. Uh, so when it comes to compute intensive tasks like building a, a neural network that is probably always going to be something that's going to be left outside of Igeo but making use of a model that has already been computed, we can probably make that inside of Igeo. This is some, an ongoing discussion that we're having right now in the team. So, uh, but in the meantime, while we are settling on this discussion, you can always do it outside. And we will interoperate with, these, with, with um, uh, the Google um, slip of mind. Yeah, the TensorFlow. TensorFlow, of course. Yeah. yeah. So we, we will interoperate with the TensorFlow, uh, of course. So and we this is how we do it today yeah. uh, when we run it internally. Um, and the discussion, like I said, is whether or not we should bring in parts of this into Agio. Yeah. But but I you know I I see this uh, as also I've been you know when when thinking about machine learning uh, that there might be good reasons for having that you know inside of Agio as. Uh, uh, means of uh, detecting anomalies and detecting weird behavior or you know reacting on lots of data uh, and and to make actions on that uh, you know the actual values the payload from absolutely uh, it's just a, a machine learning is such a dynamic um, environment so yeah. that when you receive new data you want to retrain your models uh, to make sure that they are up to date and so this is this is like a perpetuating machine. Can't, so can't you use machine learning to train the, the machine learning or you know? Yeah, Google. Now, you know, you see, I'm far off from. Yeah, yeah. The, the go the go engine that, that was. Uh, okay. So Google has done that with chess. With, tried that out with uh, chess engines and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah, but we're not there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, what we're doing is much simpler. Yeah, I mean, we will get there uh, mm. in some form. Uh, from my end, it, it becomes also then like a business uh, strategy kind of a issue, you know, right. uh, which I understand is not part of the technical, you know. No, no, but we want to, you know, if we, we want to serve the customers. If yeah. the customers has this need, of course, we will be there. Yeah, and a lot of our customers uh, won't necessarily be using uh, AI to, to do things, they would rely on us, you know, delivering that. Mm -hmm. But some other customers will most likely be, you know, quite advanced in, in this area. Uh, so we need to have, find that balance, of course. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So Ulrich, you've been working for quite some time with IoT. Mm -hmm. If we uh, talk a bit about uh, like networks, I mean, uh, we are, I've learned from you that there is only two ways of addressing a device. Either it's I over IP, or it's through a gateway, right? Mm -hmm. Is that still true? Yeah, pretty much, yeah, that's yeah. true. I mean, so if we're talking about LoRaWAN networks and, I don't know, C-Wave, Zigbee, or stuff like that, mm -hmm. that will, of course, run through a gateway. Yeah. And if it's uh, most likely IP or, you know, Ethernet and stuff like that, uh, Wi-Fi or even cellular, it's most likely we'll have an IP address that we can communicate. I'm not really sure if it's it, within your, you know, uh, domain to uh, contemplate a bit about uh, radio technology. 
I mean, it's a bit uh, on, the, on the outside of is, what yeah. you're doing, yeah. but I mean, you need to relate to it in, in some form because, mm -hmm. you know, sooner or later, guys like me will come with a project. And, mm -hmm. Well, hey, let's let's do this. <laughs> and you'll go happy-go-lucky. Yeah, we'll fix it. Yeah. <laughs> give it. Give us a week or three. Uh, but but uh, do you have anything to say about, you know, what, what is coming uh, in the IoT industry? I, I see there's a lot of LoRaWAN. There's, you know, 5G G yeah. with whatever that is. I'm not really quite sure yet. Uh, then you have the, the LTE networks, the narrowband, the cellular stuff. But I can see that there is something missing here. And I, I have an, you know, like an idea that everything converges towards IP in the end. Uh, if you look in the rear view mirror, what, what has happened in the late lots, I don't know, 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, remember IPX? Yes. Uh, the no novel stuff. Um, things will converge towards IP sooner or later. This is true. So, um, I, I don't know. No, uh, the thing is that I, I think that everybody is uh, really one, one standard. But in all fairness, I think we need to understand the fact that IoT is not mature enough for this yet. So I think the 5G may be uh, a way forward, but looking at the devices out there, we, we, it spans um, vast ranges. So you have small devices running on a, on a battery. Yeah. That, that's on one end of the scale. And then on the other side... It's difficult for these type of devices to do proper IP communication, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so, so you that's, would need like LoRa and Or Seaway like or some other special designed uh, yeah. uh, protocol to be able, that is really, really uh, low power yeah. so that this device will work. And then on the other side, you have the, the connected, the power connected devices that are, you know, they, yeah. they, can, they can do whatever. Yeah, I mean, we work a lot with uh, our friends uh, on the other side of the highway here, right? The Axis, yeah. uh, which are doing some very cool hardware Indeed. that we are using. Yeah. And it's IP connected, it's yeah. just ready to go. Right? And, and you know, it's easy to say that in such a situation, oh, let's go with that, because that's so much easier. And it's true, it is. But, you know, the customers, they have this big range. Yeah. So as far as converging goes, well, we haven't seen that yet. Yeah. It will probably happen, but we're not there yet. Oh, up, 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 up. So we're still with the with the two ways and the gateways and all of that. We and uh, this is not a problem. I mean, we, we can we can handle it. Igio oh. can handle it, and it will. From the good part of this story is that this is one of those things that Igio will take care of. So no matter how complicated and how many protocols you actually have in your IoT space, uh, Igio will provide one way for you to access all those devices. That is, that is kind of, uh, I think it's uh, cool. I mean, that's, uh, you know, when I were an architect earlier, I actually did my own kind of architecture and how I see that, you know, what, what features and functionality uh, you want inside of a platform mm -hmm. uh, and what do you not want. You don't want, you know, LoRa, that, that's not, you know, that's just transport, right? It is. Uh, the, the Ethernet is just transport. It doesn't matter. You need to be able to like, for instance, if you talk about smart city, uh, in a municipality or a city, you have a lot of different uh, businesses going on, right? You have healthcare, you have uh, the schools, and you have to take care about the parks and, and the, the, the traffic management and all of these devices and, and things that you need to connect them to make this work. It, it just you know goes without saying that you need to be able to uh, Handle all protocols, right? Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. I'm trying to find a way somewhere where we don't agree, Rick, and really? I'm sure we will get there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, from your stance and, and where you are at, what, what, what are the, like the major, I don't know, two or three things that is on your table for 2021? What, what's going on? What's cooking? Well, uh, we need to make sure that we have the scalability in place. 
Yeah. We are the, the uh, Kubernetes and the all. Kubernetes stuff. Yeah, yeah that needs yeah. to that needs to be put in production properly, and we need to. Well, it is in production, isn't it? Parts of it, but we want to put we want to put more customers on it. We yeah. want to, we want to move over everybody. Is it actually in effect? It's actually a year three we're talking about. Yeah. So we want to put more customers on a year three. We want to move away from a year two because yeah. we don't want to spread ourselves thin over two platforms when we can do it. We're just keeping a year three alive. Yeah. Um, so that's a big one yeah. uh, for 2021. Um, then uh, we, we have some internal stuff that we want to uh, we want to make sure that we are on top of. Um, so we got the uh, there is a, a database placement that we want to we want to clean up, and when we got that in place, uh, so, you, you, so you're changing database. Yeah. That's the that's the plan. Oh, so this is would be, then be one of these you know micro modules that yes. we're using. Yes. So we're using a, a database underneath today called MongoDB. Yeah. And they've changed license on us uh, midstream, so that they were permissive license once upon a time, but now they've changed the license. So now they're under a different license, which is not permissive anymore. Yeah, I, I remember us talking about this. It was I think a year ago or something yeah. like that. I mean, uh, they they are doing this because uh, there is a lot of uh, companies using MongoDB and charging for it in a way that you know didn't really fit. Those. Yeah, they. I, I think it also they needed in their new business model. They created the the database as a platform, yeah. and they wanted to charge for that. Then 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 they don't want any competition. Okay. So that so it makes sense from their perspective, but it is really not good for us. Yeah. So we want to. Is we, this where Cockroach comes in? Yes. Yeah. So we're going to move over to another database that's called Cockroach DB. Yeah. Uh, and this is a, not a small feat. So we've been planning it for a while, and now we, we think that it's going to be happen in 2021. Okay. The good news about this is yeah. that the immediate benefit will be that we can make Igo even more stable, because that means that we now can deploy Kubernetes um, not only just in one data center. We can actually deploy it in several data centers, and they will sync automatically between data centers. And this is. This is so much magic that it's really hard to grasp, but it means that from a customer perspective, that we will be even more um, resilient to downtime. So even if a data center goes down, we can actually still keep the customer platform alive. Uh, well, it's uh, again some kind of black magic. Yeah, this this is uh, uh, this is a big one, uh, 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 and plus the fact that we get a good license, of course. Yeah. So that's a big one. Um, we, we're rolling, uh, in the same time, we're also looking at 2021, rolling out uh, the fact that a, uh, we can have, uh, on a year three, we can allow for a third party to write translators. Yeah, that, that's, 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 for me, is a huge one. I, you know, when I interact with my, well, again, our customers and, and our partners, uh, for, you know, from a business scalability perspective, I mean, it's it's a uh, very it's a big downer <laughs> when I let the customer know that yeah, you can add what what you want, but uh, we need actually to charge you for the hours. Yeah. And then also when we do th these hours, it steals man hours from from, from doing these other things. Right? It does. And also th another <clears throat> another big problem is that um, if we update uh, a translator, we have to do a full release of Igio. Which you know, we just changed change this translator. So yeah. the, there are many good things about this uh, uh, separation of the translators from Igio itself. Uh, so, so would it uh, you know uh, be possible for like you know I know our partners are great, but but you know we are all human. Sometimes uh, some uh, guy or girl will write some bad piece of code, mm -hmm. will that, you know, infect our IGU in some form? Well, the thing is that this is what we've been working very hard on, that we're going to have to accept the fact that sometimes someone does a mistake. Yeah. Uh, so what's going to happen is that the translator will be run in a separate sandbox. So it will be run in the context of IGU, but it will be run in a separate sandbox, saved away from everything else. Uh, and we, you can only do so many operations or uh, inside the sandbox. So uh, will, we, will we then uh, do some validation uh, of the 
code or? Uh, so we're going to do this in several steps. So the first step is that we're actually going to move out our translators out of Igio and into this sandboxed environment. Okay. Um, and then the being able to for anyone to upload any kind of code in a web interface. That's that's a further step down the line. We we haven't reached that part yet. It sounds like a, what do you call it a honeypot for for malicious stuff. Yeah, and the, you know, so the the thing is that we actually um, this is not something that we've come up with with the in the, the sandbox is actually uh, taken from a game. Okay. So there is a there is a big huge uh, game online where you can upload your code and you run it. And you know, as far as this game works, uh, you should be able to run as well. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah. Well, with the difference that you know, Igu is not a game. It's about you know, sometimes life and death. Of course, <laughs> but but it, the thing is, I think the takeaway here is that it's completely separated. Yeah. So it, it will. You can crash that sandbox, or you can do stuff within that sandbox that will make it go bad, and that's fine because it will not affect Igu itself. Uh. So. Okay, so um, of course, you know, we, we don't want to push our, our customers and partners to use our API, right? Yep. We want them to use their ordinary day-to-day -day interface for the end users and, and, and similar. Uh, but we do come, it comes with a set of uh, applications today, yep. like the control panel to manage your devices, you have the rule engine, uh, you have the organization manager, and you have the installer app, and then you have the uh, location manager, of course, uh, where you can see all your devices on a map and, and things like that. Uh, as I understand it, and you know, uh, I've, I've heard a lot about it, and I've seen a mock-up, but when can I expect some updates on our own interface? Uh, and yeah. what will that look like? What, what is that? Right. So we've. Um We've worked, I think, better part for a year about doing components, uh, UI components, and then. So now we're talking components again. Yes. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll get back to that. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Continue. So, the, the, so right now, just the, yesterday, we finished the uh, installation manager application. Okay. Um, uh, the device installer application. Sorry. Oh. And that application is written with these components. And the UI components, that you do, we use a, a framework called Storybook, which is used by many. Storybook. Uh, Storybook. Okay. JavaScript. So within that framework, you can create your own UI components, and then you can reuse those components within any application that you write. So we write our applications these days in React and Storybook components. Okay. So and the idea behind that is that we should be able to uh, open source. <clears throat> these components so that any one of our partners can just go in there and grab them and use them. And I am advocating internally here that we should be able to open source our applications as well so that our, our partners can take that code and look at it and understand it and then make it, change it so it fits yeah. their application. I mean, we already have a, a couple of uh, organizations using our existing SDK, uh, mm -hmm. I, I know. Uh, so I'm sure that there is a lot of uh, you know uh, people out there who want to use that uh, to interact with. with yeah, right. I, think, yeah. I think that well, you well, will well, be able to. I think you will be able to uh, create an application a lot faster using yeah. the, this. Uh, but, but, but but you know since it's uh, all these words, your storybook uh, you're talking about, and uh, so I, I get a bit confused. But but when when you say a component, yeah. Uh, could a component be, I guess, Tom got bored. Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> he left us. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but a component, might that be like add a device? Can, yes, that, that might be. Um, get, be. Get, get the list. Uh, I, I want to see all my devices. Is that a component? Yes. In itself? Yes. Okay. But, there, but the component can also be just a button or it can be a menu bar. I mean, and so um, we got everything from the small, simple stuff to the more complicated co components. Okay. So and these, so basically, when you look at our applications, if you you know, they are literally 
very simple containers, just dragging in one large component, which is the main page, uh, and then everything is componentized from there. I know, I know you hate this word, uh, but I'm going to try it on you. Uh, but uh, there's concept about no code development. Yeah. Uh, would these components would, would could they, they be part of a no code kind of uh, situation? So you just bring in this piece of code. I suppose. I, I, I really, I really don't know. There are low-code tools, and there are no-code tools. I'm just trying to find something. Yeah, that, sure. That, that, we, that we can disagree on. I think that if you're a JavaScript developer and web developer, yeah, uh, you will appreciate this. Uh, you, you will work with the you will, yeah the React and the components that we bring to the table that you can yeah. start using. I think you're going to appreciate that a lot. But I think you dodged my question. When will you know? I, when will I actually be able to see this? Uh, when, when can my customer use it? You use <clears throat> the the application, like I said, we, we released it um, for testing internally yesterday. The, but that's one, just one part, right? That's yes. the installation, device installation manager. Yeah, but that's like the first one out the door. Okay. And then you, so the components for that one is actually done. So you can go into the component library, uh, which is a web server, and you can actually scroll through and look at all the components you got okay. there. There are hundreds of them. Is it, I mean, uh, the functionality has been there, but it might not have been, you know, extremely beautiful, everything that you see. No. <laughs> Uh, are we uh, picking up just a, a bit on, on yeah, the... Yeah, yeah, no, we've actually had a graphical artist help us do this work. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, so, because I know that uh, a number of our customers uh, are maybe not there yet uh, where they have the resources or you know the time to do the integration through our API. Mm -hmm. So they are using our applications. So now of course if, if we can bring them some you know good looking applications, they're gonna be happy. Yeah, so we, we are updating our applications. It's yeah. going to take time because there's so much in the existing ones that it's going to take time to replace them all. But yeah, we yeah. Surely, slowly but surely we will do it. Yeah. Yeah and we will all do it will all be componentized when we're done. Well, okay, so you, when 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 are we? We're never done yet. No, no. We, okay. we, but when but when when, you, when we thrown out the old ones and we because yeah, we will well, always. That's a good. That's a good one. When have we thrown out? You know the old ones. When is the control panel history? Yeah, I think you should talk to my project manager about that one. But uh, <laughs> I mean, we are working on that. Yeah, uh, we're, we're talking twenty twenty one. I hope. Yeah, I think that uh, I take that uh, as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the work way. is ongoing. I can tell you that much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we covered a lot of uh, you know what is Sergio, what 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 is the the architecture, what what's what's the goal of things. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, Mats or other guys here talk about the. What do you call it? The comparison with uh, Android for mobile phones, you yeah. know, where the phone is the hardware and all the Instagrams and apps and TikToks and stuff is the services, and then you have the operating system. Yeah. Uh, w would you still say that's a fair comparison? I, I think that that comparison is, is, I mean, it's viable, and I think it's, uh, um, I think it's uh, works from a pedagogical standpoint. I think it's, a, it's, it's actually quite good. Yeah, um, we don't have uh, Facebook or any uh, any apps like that yet. But let, you know. But what we have will look good. Oh, yes, it's it just will. a matter of time. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's all about components and <laughs> microservices. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think we should uh, sum up there and mm -hmm. just say that you know uh, I think we have. Uh, if I look at the competition or. I mean, there's not a lot of similar uh, platforms out there when I look at it. Uh, I see a lot of marketing, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't see if, you know, really looking under the hood, I don't see a lot of uh, other platforms uh, doing what we do. Um, so, yeah, well, I think I, when I represent, uh, if I were to represent the rest of Sensitive, I think uh, you guys are doing a great job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, there's a, a, you know, we, we are working very hard on, on the things that you don't see. So like the scalability and stuff like that. We, we, we poured a lot of uh, 
effort into making sure that this yeah. will this will work. And th this also goes for security. And these are features that you know you you can say it very nice on a marketing page. We are secure. We are fast. We yeah. scale. But you know, from our perspective, we can actually stand for that. We can say that we we got that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when the shit really hits the fan, mm -hmm. uh, when we see like half of the internet going down, uh, that's a problem for us also, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yes. In the future, we we have we have plans, but um, so you can run your locally. You want to com componentify internet? Or what, what's, what's the idea? <laughs> yeah, the idea is that you should be able to run parts of your installation locally. Okay. So that if you have a, a really, really important part that you don't want to be sensitive to whether or not internet is working. Yeah. So as long as your local network is up. Like in a building or... Yeah. yeah. Or, or a house or a flat or yeah. a staircase. I mean, it makes sense. Uh, the internet is becoming more and more, of course, of, uh, of our, it's more and more of importance for our day-to-day -day lives, right? Mm -hmm. uh, once in, when internet stops, I mean, the society stops more it or does, less. Yeah. So it would be good to actually be able to turn on the light, mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. even though internet is down, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but, that's, but that's for 2022? Yes, or? probably even further than that. Okay, okay. But yeah, great talk, Ulrich. Uh, thanks for letting us steal you from your computer. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, cheers.